okay and i will now share screen with you oh my okay are we still connected can you hear me Screen sharing is paused. Am I audible? Am I audible? Ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Ma okay, thank you. Because there is seriously some issue over here. I'm just constantly losing. Uh, yeah. Just one second. Let me try sharing screen again. Okay. So just to give you a recap of what we did last time, okay? Uh, it's in very, very brief, all right? Uh, so just one second, let me see if I can go to the full screen mode. Okay, so, fine. So what happened now? Okay, so basically, if you remember, we did something called as the generalized uncertainty principle um, if you remember we looked at what was the significance of the commutator relation between operators now once again to recall to you wave functions have all the information about the physical system the information is there but to get that information out I think my internet connection is extremely unstable today, okay? Let's hope we won't have more trouble, <laughs> okay? So let me just share screen again. Am I audible? Can everybody hear me? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yeah, I'm sorry. I'm just uh, glitching out and in. There is some problem here. Okay. So if you remember, as I was saying, that wave functions have essentially information about the physical system. To be able to read that information, you need to do some mathematical operations on it, right? And for that, you will have an operator. Now, what we have learned is that the commutator relation between the operators, which is, what do you do? You take operator, let us say you have an operator A and an operator B. You take the difference with the, between the operation AB and the operation BA. So AB minus BA, that is called the commutator of AB. And that commutator relation, we realize, has something very strongly linked to whether we can make simultaneous measurements of two dynamical variables or we cannot. So we found that when the commutators commute, uh, when the operators commute, that is, when commutator of AB is equal to zero, then we can do simultaneous measurements. Basically, how did we say it formally? We say that A and B have a common set of eigenfunctions. Now, I think my recording has gone away again, hasn't it? No. Okay, no, it is on. Uh, can everybody see the recording icon? Is it yes, on? Okay, fine. So now, uh, what we did after that, once we realized that there was an important um, takeaway from the commutator relation of two operators, in terms of whether we could simultaneously measure those two physical variables or we cannot, okay? We went into something which we called as the generalized uncertainty relation. And one thing very important that we learned over there is how do we define... Uh, has my screen gone blank? Yes, ma'am. Okay. Yes, ma'am. I have no idea why that has happened. Let me try. Ah, yeah, it's back again. Can everybody see it? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma okay, good. <laughs> Today is not my day, it looks like. So what was I saying? Yeah, we learned how to define something called as an uncertainty of a variable. Okay, so remember, I say variable, but over here, we are connecting it with the operator. Okay, 
So this delta A, which we say is the uncertainty in the dynamical variable, which is linked to this operator A. And how do we define it? Let me just try and get my spotlight. Then it will be better, I think. We essentially define it as the, just one second, somebody has to be admitted. Uh, we define it as the expectation value of A square minus the expectation value of A, the whole square, the expectation value of this quantity under root, okay? So that is how we define the, um, what do you call the uncertainty in the physical or, in the, or the dynamical variable, which is associated with A. It's more easy to understand with this expression. How do you define it? That you have A minus expectation value of A, but then, as I told you, this can be both positive and negative. So we square it, take the expectation of that, and then take under root of it. So that is how you define your ex, uh, uncertainty in, say, the dynamical variable, which is associated with the operator A. Now, if I represent this delta A simply as sigma A, the reason why I have put this is because various places they use various definitions. So you can write your sigma A into sigma B is, sorry, I put an equal to, it should be greater than or equal to one by two I. And this is essentially the expectation value of the commutator between A and B. Okay, so please remember this should be a greater than or equal to, I will change this, okay? I obviously didn't, wasn't thinking too much when I made this slide. All right, so I hope everybody remembers how we derived this uncertainty relation and I also showed you that when you do it between x and px, that is the position in the x direction and the linear momentum in the x direction, then you know that the commutator value is how much? ih cross. And once you do that, you realize you get your uncertainty principle, which you have been learning so far, which is delta x, delta px is greater than or equal to h cross by 2. Okay, so remember, please remember, do not get confused if somebody gives you sigma A and sigma B. Remember that they mean the same thing as uncertainty in A and uncertainty in B. All right. After this, what did we do last time? We moved on to something called as unitary transformations. And unitary transformations, what do we talk about? We basically think about a method of going from one representation to another representation. And how did I explain it to you? Uh, last time I told you it was essentially like, you know, doing, trying to solve a problem in Cartesian coordinates and then realizing that, hey, it is actually much easier to do this in maybe spherical polar coordinates or in cylindrical coordinates. So let's take the example of cylindrical coordinates. So you basically then convert the problem from a problem in Cartesian coordinates to a problem in spherical polar coordinates. Okay, I'm sorry. I said cylindrical coordinates, doesn't matter. So you convert it from Cartesian coordinates to cylindrical coordinates, okay? Now that doesn't mean that the problem itself has changed or that the answers that you get now are going to be answers which are not applicable to when the situation was in Cartesian coordinates, right? We all know this. And why do we do this? Not because we are, you know, we just feel like troubling ourselves more, but because the problem is such that it is more easily solved in cylindrical coordinates, right? Now, the same thing may need, need to be done in quantum mechanics. You have a problem which is stated in a particular way, all right? It is given in one framework, but then you may need to put it in a new representation. And to do that, you use something called as unitary transformations. So the unitary transformations, please remember, involves a unitary operator, okay? So it involves a unitary operator. We all know the definition of a unitary operator. A unitary operator is one where the uh, adjoint of the operator, what is the adjoint? It's the transpose conjugate. So the transpose conjugate of the operator is also its inverse. So you, how do we write the transpose conjugate of an operator in quantum mechanics? We write it as dagger. So u, u dagger is equal to the identity operator which is also equal to u dagger u, all right? So this is what an unitary operator is. And unitary transformations, of course, involve unitary operators. Now, what 
if what were, what was the basic thing if that x and psi are wave functions and if a is an operator then when we transform we write the new wave function x prime as u operating on x we write the new uh, operator uh, sorry wave function psi prime as u operating on psi and what happens to a the new form of the operator a prime is nothing but u a u dash okay so if we use these rules that all wave functions transform like the first two statements i have put over here and all uh, what do you call it operators transform like the third rule that i have put here then we find that the physics of the problem remains unchanged okay so just like when you change from let us say uh, cartesian coordinates to cylindrical coordinates or cartesian coordinates to spherical polar coordinates you have rules of transformation right similarly these are the rules over here for unitary transformations and then what happens is the physics remains unchanged unaltered how are we assured about this we are assured about this because the hermeticity of operators so if an operator is hermitian to begin with after you transform it also it is hermitian operator relations if there's some relation between Two, three, four operators. Then the same relation continues when we transform them as well. Commutation relations, extremely important, and I hope it is clear from this discussion on the commutator properties as well as uncertainty relation. Commutation relations remain the same. Very important. Eigenvalues remain the same. Okay, because eigenvalues, please remember, are linked to measurement, right? expectation values are remaining the same so thereby essentially the physics does not change okay now what else did we learn after this we essentially went on to look at the matrix representation of wave functions as well as of operators so i will just repeat the last few that we did for that i will go to my ice cream and if there are any doubts please tell me right away so that we can clear it and then we can move on So are there any doubts, please? Any doubts, please? First of all, am I still connected with you? Because I'm today. I'm getting very nervous. Thanks to all the power cuts I'm getting over here. Am I audible? Are you able to hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay, good. So any doubts, please? Or it was all okay? Any doubts? Yes no either you have a doubt or you don't have a doubt No ma'am What happened I have put you all to sleep already Gagana Any doubts is it okay No ma'am I can't hear you ma Ma'am Yeah is it okay any doubts Ma'am Yes, I'm here. I yeah. Tell me, Gagna. Yes, ma'am. Ah, and what you are saying? Sorry, ma'am. Yes, tell me, please. I'm audible. Yeah, you are audible, Gagna. Hello. Are we connected? Okay, Gagna. Please ask your doubt if you have any. i think we suddenly she's i think not connected or something all right so we will wait for her please feel free to ask even if i get started okay anybody else any doubts please okay, okay. we will assume that right, okay yeah gagana are you back with us hi ah, yes ma'am yes, ma yeah you have any doubts gagana no ma'am no ma'am okay fine fine but feel free to ask okay all of you please so now let's go on to uh discussing what we did at the end of our what we did at the right at the end and this was essentially we looked at matrix representations right of firstly we considered that of wave functions right and next we were essentially looking at the situation with operators right 
So I will not uh, repeat too much about wave functions. All of you know that wave functions essentially you will get a column matrix, right? And if you want to convert it to its equivalent bra vector, it becomes a row with each element being replaced by its complex conjugate, right? And then we learned how essentially you would have a relation between uh, the elements and the basis set by which you are uh, writing it up. So I think it is all there in my notes last time. If you have gone through it, if you have doubts, we will uh, look at them. But right now, I think we will just leave it be, okay? Because I think I've covered it quite a few times and I don't want to really waste time doing it over again, especially if you have no doubts. But if you have doubts, please stop me and ask me, okay? So we will look a little more into the situation of operators. And as I told you, we all know, of course, that operators are represented by what? They are represented essentially by square matrices, okay? We know this. Hmm? I hope I've convinced you of this so far. So they are represented by square matrices. And then, of course, if you have an operator which is nothing but C equal to A plus B, then remember that the matrix, so the matrix elements will go like this, Cij is equal to Aij plus Bij, okay? This we did last time, if you remember. Then, of course, we should remember that addition of operators is commutative, as is the addition of matrices. So A plus B is equal to B plus A. Then what did we learn? We talked about the multiplication of operators. So if your C is equal to AB, last time, if you remember, we proved that it means that your Cij element will be equal to summation over K, A, I, K, B, K, J, okay? And please remember that this K is repeated here and here, okay? Here it is the, what is it? It is the column number, right? Column number. And for this, it is nothing but the row number, okay? And it will always be this way, all right? So please, please, please remember this, right? And of course, we realized also from matrices as well that A, B need not be the same as B, A. Okay, sometimes if they are the same, then we say that the two operators are commuting. Okay, apart from this, what did we learn? <clears throat> that the multiplication is distributive over addition. What does that mean? That if you have A, B plus C, then this is equal to A, B plus A, C. And lastly, we also did the uh, associative nature which is if you have A, B, C, this is the same as A, B, C. Remember, whatever is in the bracket gets done together, okay? So remember over here also, it will mean first C will operate, then the product A, B will operate, correct? Here it means the product B, C operates first and then A operates and the two results should be identical, okay? So that is what I mean. So if you remember, this is distributive over distributive over addition, right? Multiplication is distributive over addition and this is associative nature. This is the associative property, okay? So I think we stopped over here last time. <clears throat> Are there any doubts please in these initial things? Because I think with matrices, you would have anyway covered it. But now these matrices are not just matrices alone. They are operators. And they are going to be able to get information for us from the wave functions. Okay. So that is what we need to remember. Fine. So now let us just go over and cover certain things which are fairly trivial. Okay. Because now once you know that the matrices, square matrices represent the operators, what I'm going to tell you is not going to I think I lost connection again, so I'm really sorry about that. Okay, so I will get back to my ice cry. 
So am I back with you guys? Can you hear me? Yes, yes ma'am. Okay. I'm really sorry about this. Okay. I'm hoping that I can settle it for the next class at least. <laughs> right now, let's not waste time and just go ahead. So, um, yeah. So what I was trying to tell you is that a lot of things that I'm going to tell you now will seem a little trivial because you said, okay, operators are represented by square matrices. So I will assume that all the rules that work for square matrices automatically follow for operators. Okay. So this is what I would like you to remember. So now the point is that, uh, yeah. So let us uh, try and see uh, what we mean by inverse of an operator, okay? So obviously, if A is an operator and A inverse is its inverse, then you know that A, A inverse is equal to I, okay? So if this is represented by a square matrix, okay? Then obviously the inverse square matrix that same inverse square matrix, okay, will represent your A inverse, right? Now, how do I write it? Uh, basically, you know, I, I have written it as I. So how do I write it, uh, you know, in matrix language? So I will say that A, A inverse, if I take the element Ij, this will be equal to nothing but delta Ij. And all of you, I hope, remember what delta Ij is. So this delta is the Kronecker delta function. It is equal to, I'm just going to repeat once more at the risk of boring you. It is equal to one when I is equal to J and it's equal to zero when I is not equal to J. So only when row is equal to column, row number is equal to column number, it will be a one. And if the row number is not equal to the column number, it will be a zero, which means the diagonal elements, leading diagonal elements are all one and everything else is a zero and that you know is an identity matrix right so that is not a confusion now uh, what about transpose of the operator so transpose of an operator okay so this is more easily usually you will represent if a is the operator you will represent it as a t how would you write it in matrix language you would say a t the i j is not I j is yeah. equal to a, a j i perfect very nice thank you yeah a j i okay so this is what it essentially means now let's uh, go on further how about adjoint okay so let's get to adjoint because that is more important for us okay so let's go to adjoint and you know how adjoint is represented adjoint we represent it, if A is the operator, then its adjoint is represented as A dagger, right? So if we want to do A dagger IJ, what will that be? That will be nothing but A, rows have to change to columns. Adjoint is a double operation, yeah. right? Transpose and then conjugate. So this will be A, J, I, and then you'll have to do a conjugation yeah. star, okay? So please just remember this because sometimes you're given problems, okay? In which case it will be easy for you to do it in the matrix uh, relations. Right. Now, uh, what about unitary matrix? A unitary matrix, you know, is a special one. Okay, I should remember to change the page here. Okay, so unitary matrix is a special one. So here, if you remember, so when is a matrix called a unitary matrix? So if U is the matrix and U dagger is its transpose conjugate or its adjoint, then you know it's unitary if U, U dagger is equal to I is equal to U dagger U, correct? So how do you uh, write it in matrix language? You will say that U, U dagger IJ must be equal to delta ij we will actually prove it okay in some i mean we will uh, kind of uh, talk about it in some time all right then a very very important thing uh, which let me just uh, explain to you uh, this is a trace of a matrix okay so 
i think you've all learnt it already yeah uh, so what is the trace of a matrix so if you have a matrix a so similarly of course this applies to operators because as you know operators are represented by square matrices so you have now a square matrix which is representing this operator a what would be the trace of this essentially you take all the leading diagonal so this is the leading diagonal right you take all the elements that are sitting on the leading diagonal okay and you add them up so essentially trace of a is nothing but summation over i okay what would be uh, a i i okay so essentially you take all those elements where the row number is the same as the column number and those will be essentially your leading diagonal elements you add them all up and you get your trace okay now why am i bringing up this concept uh it's a little important and i will tell you why okay um so remember apart from the trace remember when do we call do we call a matrix a diagonal matrix can somebody tell me when is a matrix called a diagonal matrix non zero elements when do you call it a diagonal matrix take a guess it's ma'am diagonal elements all is diagonal elements uh, it's only for non zero elements ma'am correct absolutely correct i think there were at least two people who told me the correct answer very good only the diagonal elements the leading diagonal okay please remember it is always the leading diagonal why do i insist about leading diagonal remember if you have a matrix okay it has two diagonals right squares have two diagonals one is this and one is this correct yeah this is also a diagonal so this is what you call as the leading diagonal okay this is the one you call as the leading diagonal so what they said is absolutely correct to your classmates that the leading diagonal elements are non zero everything else is zero okay so or you can say the only non zero elements in the matrix can be found in the leading diagonal please remember some of those leading diagonal elements may still be zero not a problem but not all of them should be zero okay so you could have something like 3 8 0 24 uh, minus 32 okay you could have something like that but at least some of those elements should be non zero and the rest of the elements will definitely be zero okay so this is what uh, a diagonal matrix is now so when would you say uh, uh, so i anyway so you've understood uh, so only leading diagonal elements elements can be non zero okay now just let us now um look at something a little carefully okay uh, you have an operator a okay and you have the set of its eigen functions which are these uis and we know let us it's let's say a is an observable if it is an observable then we know that this is a orthonormal set and this is also a complete set now i am asking the question that i am going to use the set of uis as a basis okay i am going to express everything in terms of uis okay so what is the representation what is the representation of a in basis set ui okay this is the question that i am asking what is the representation of a when i am using the uis only as a basis set and basic 
the answer so what we what do we know about uis they are all eigen functions of a right so that means if i pick up any ui i will get some ai ui correct so we know this so now what is an element of a okay this we learned last time and this will be nothing but ui a u j okay so i hope everybody remembers this expression it's a very important one and i had asked you to remember it i didn't put it in the recap today morning i should have i'm sorry about that but i hope you remember this okay so now what will this be this will be nothing but ui i can write it as a u j correct then this will be nothing but ui this is again we know this uj is an eigen function of a so i will get what some small number aj some some number aj uj but this is a number so i can bring it out so i will bring it out and i will write it here and you will get u i u j correct this is going to be aj delta i j okay so please note that okay i'm going to write it here itself a i j is nothing but a j delta i j so only when i is equal to j this will be non zero otherwise okay it will be zero is everybody convinced about that when i is not equal to j a i j is equal to zero agreed what is i i is row number what is j j is column number so whenever column number is not the same as row number then the element becomes zero so which means all non diagonal elements are zero only diagonal elements are non zero and what are those diagonal elements they are nothing but the eigen values of a okay so what does this prove that leading diagonal will be non zero and everything else where i is not equal to j it will become equal to zero okay so that is what it means so this is so what you have to understand so i'm going to change the page now what you have to understand is that a is diagonal so whenever you take an operator and use its own eigen functions as the basis set the representation of that operator becomes diagonal and what are the diagonal elements the diagonal elements are the eigen values of a okay so therefore ui a uj okay which is equal to a i j is nothing but c say a j delta i j so now let us ask ourselves a question what would be trace of a trace of a is nothing but summation over i a i i correct which is nothing but summation over i i can also write it as ui a ui right which is equal to summation over i a i delta i i right so it is nothing but the sum of all eigen values of a so please remember the trace of an operator a when you are using its own eigen functions as the basis set is the sum of all the eigen values of a is this clear to everybody any doubts has everybody followed what happened i'm sending you all off to sleep today or what are yes, you very tired have you followed yes, 
Okay, fine. So I could hear yes, one. Yes, I'm assuming that you've all followed. Great. So now that we have worked out the trace of the, uh, what do you call it? Uh, the trace of the uh, operator. Let us ask ourselves a question is how do you find the eigenvalues of an operator? Okay. So when it's in the matrix representation, how do you find the eigenvalues? And the answer is very simple. Okay. To find eigenvalues, Okay, to find eigenvalues, what do you have to do? You basically solve the characteristic equation. What is the characteristic equation? Essentially, determinant have, of uh, yeah, determinant a minus lambda i. A minus lambda i. Okay, is equal to zero. This is the characteristic equation. What is i? I is your identity matrix. A is, of course, the matrix that is representing your operator. And obviously, you will get a polynomial. You, If you write out the determinant, you will get a polynomial in lambda. Okay? And then you solve that polynomial, you will get that many, what do you call it? You're going to get that many solutions for lambda and those will be your eigenvalues of a okay so please remember this right so now let's return to unitary transformations in matrices okay so far we have been generally talking about operator properties when operators are represented by matrices now let's look at unitary transformations in matrix representation okay so this is what we are going to do now we are going to talk about unitary, sorry, unitary transformations. In matrix representations. Okay, so this is what we are going to talk about. All right. So let me just, uh, yeah, one second, I will get the appropriate page of my notes. Yeah. So now, what do we know about unitary transformations? Okay. So essentially, what you're doing over here is that you have representation one. I will just explain this a little more. And you're going to a new representation, right? You're going from representation one to representation two via a unitary transformation. And we know that this does not alter the physics of the situation. Now, remember that your basis set in representation one is by some science, let's say. Okay. Yeah. So these are your basis set in representation one. So like, for instance, when you are in Cartesian coordinates, your basis set is what? unit vector i, unit vector j, unit vector k. From that, you can do a transformation to spherical polar coordinates. What are your coordinates there? What are your basis vectors there? It is r cap, theta cap, and phi cap. Okay? So please remember that. So here now, in your new representation, you're going to now have a new basis set, okay? Which are called your phi ends. Right? What do we know about these psi ends and phi ends? We know that they are orthonormal and they are complete. Right? They are orthonormal and they are complete. How do we write down the orthonormality relation? We will say something like psi i psi j is equal to delta i j. That will represent orthonormality. How do we write that they are complete? We write down the closure relation. We can say that if we do this, then we will get the identity operator. Now, the same things holds for the phi ends as well. Okay. So, we know the phi ends are also orthonormal. We also know that the phi ends are complete. 
Now remember the number of psi n uh, eigenfunctions will be exactly the same as the number of phi n eigenfunctions. So for instance, when you go in Cartesian coordinates, i, j, k, there are three. You go to spherical polar coordinates, you have r, theta, phi, again three. If you go to cylindrical coordinates, that is r, theta, and h, again three. Okay, so please remember that the number is not going to get altered. The number of linearly independent eigenfunctions is not going to get altered. Okay, so here also with the phi n also, you'll have exactly the same number as you have for the sines. Okay, so here how do I write it now? Same way, I can write this as the orthonormality condition, right? The orthonormality condition. And I can also write this as the completeness condition. Now, how do I do the transformation? Your transformation, you know, basically, how does it work? You have uh, any wave function psi here, any wave function x here. Here it will become u psi. Here it will become ux. And if you have an operator, so these are again, please remember, your wave functions. And here you have psi prime x prime these are your transform wave functions and if you have an operator a here it goes there to an operator sorry a prime which is nothing but u a u value okay so now what i'm going to try and do is i'm going to basically show all these things to you in matrix representations okay so that is what we will do so let me just change my page here. I'll have to change page over there as well. Let's do that. Now we'll check on the time once because we still have some time. Okay. So now let us start off by looking at a relation. So let me go back here. Let us look at a relation between these size and these phi's. Okay, knowing that it is a U which is connecting the two, how do we define these psi's and phi's? And what is the way of defining this unitary transformation? Okay, so this is what I'm going to show you first. So basically, we will, so I will just write it down. We will expand each member. Oops. Sorry. Thank you. I somehow in my mentally, I had decided that I had changed the page. Okay. So expand each member. So this is now um, of the set. So I should have written it as a set of cats. Doesn't matter. I hope you will follow. All right. Cyan as a linear combination of members of the set okay now how do i know this is possible Please remember they all belong to the same vector space. Okay. They all, how do I know they belong to the same vector space? Because they represent the same physical system. Okay. So they all are a part of the same vector space. Okay. So this is very, very important. Also, what do I know about these files? They are complete, which means anything that belongs to that vector space. We should be able to write it down as a linear combination of these phi -ins. And the reverse is also true. I pick up any of the phi -ins, I should be able to write it as a linear combination of the psi -ins because the psi -ins also, psi -ins are also an complete set. Okay, so please remember the logic behind the whole thing. So now I should be able to pick up 
any psi n like this and be able to write it as a linear combination. Okay, so let me put it in terms of m. I don't want to get too confused. Okay, of these phi m's. Now here, of course, you're going to put in a number. Okay, and what is that number? I'm going to represent it in a special way. I'm going to call them as elements of this unitary matrix. Okay, of course, I have to prove to you that they have they are going to be unitary. So I will write this as u, and let me be a bit careful. Uh, m n okay so this m please remember is linking to this and this number and this n is linked to this okay so let me write it down a bit more cleanly again essentially your sorry psi n is equal to summation over m u m n phi m Okay, so what is this? Please again remember, I am expanding this sign as a linear combination of these. Okay, and the elements which are multiplying each of these phi m's are essentially I am describing them as elements of a matrix U. So my first job now is to show to you that U. Is unitary, okay. So this is my first job, okay. So before that, so the first thing I have to show to you is that I have to show that U is unitary, okay. So before that, I'm going to do something else. I'm going to do a Suppose now I do a phi j psi n because I'm going to require this. Okay, then this is going to be nothing but phi j. Okay, of summation over m u m n phi m. Okay, which is going to be what summation over m u m n phi j. Phi m, right? Which is going to be nothing but summation over m u m n here of delta j m. So only when m is equal to j, okay, this is going to be non-zero. Otherwise, it will always be zero. So in which case, I can remove the summation. Correct? Yeah, because the summation is over all m. I'm going from one, two, three, four, five, six to whatever. Only when it is equal to j, it is going to be non-zero. Otherwise, it will always be zero. And adding zero to something, we know, doesn't change it, right? So this will become nothing but u j n. So please remember, this is a very important definition. U j n. Sir, don't know what's happening to me today. U j n is nothing but phi j. Psi n. Okay, this is very very important. Now let us show to you, okay, that u is unitary. So let's think again. U is unitary, which means that u into u dagger is the identity. Correct? Yeah. If u is unitary, then u u dagger must be equal to identity. What does this mean? Please remember how we wrote it in the matrix relations, which implies that u u dagger. If I take the i j element. This must be equal to delta i j. I hope everybody remembers this. Okay. Now, u u dagger. How do I get the i j element? Is what I need to ask. Okay. So I'm multiplying u with u dagger, right? So in that case, I will have to write this as summation over some k. Okay. Please remember the multiplication I showed you with matrices. 
so i will have u i k u dagger k j is equal to delta i j this is what i need to prove okay this is what i need to prove so has everybody understood what i need to prove over here okay is this clear this particular last step that i came to has everybody understood mathematically what is it i need to prove yes come on make yes, it ma'am yeah okay good good thank you supriya all right so now um so therefore now let's go with the left hand side okay so let's go with the left hand side what do we have over here we have summation over k u i k u k j but this is a u dagger right so this is going to be now summation over k what is u i k let's look at this relation okay from this relation i can write it as phi i psi k okay i hope everybody got this okay what am i using please note i am using this relation here okay this one here to write what is u i k all right now what about u k j it is what did we know about the elements of the uh, adjoint this is going to be nothing but u j k star correct u j k star now what is that going to be equal to now summation over k phi i psi k and this is going to be nothing but i am going to keep the bracket again i am going to write this u j k using this relation so what will that be that will be nothing but phi j psi k star okay unfortunately i will have to change the page now so i'll do that so what did we have now u u dagger i j is equal to let me just write it down looking at the earlier page okay is equal to summation over uh, k u i k u dagger k j and this we now the last step we found that this was nothing but summation of phi i psi k and then we had in the bracket over here phi j psi k star what is this this is nothing but from your inner product rules this is going to be nothing but this okay i hope you remember hmm? this is from your inner product rules so this is going to be nothing but summation over k phi i psi k then i'm going to write this i'll get psi k phi j right now this is going to be what now please remember that since the psi ends are essentially a complete set it means that if i write this remember that this is just a dummy variable okay i can write n i can write k i can get i it doesn't matter what is this equal to this is equal to your identity okay this is your identity it's not coming out too clearly but i hope you can i'm see that so therefore now what will i get over here this and this put together gives me the identity and thereby i will get nothing but phi i phi j and this you know is nothing but delta i j so therefore i have shown that u u dagger i j th element is nothing but delta i j which implies that u u dagger is the identity 
implies u is unitary okay i hope everybody has understood this proof all right uh, so any doubts please tell me i will stop right now over here because we need to essentially uh, yeah we have another class after this uh, so i will just stop over here and i will ask you whether you have any pressing doubts otherwise we will tackle it in the next class are there any pressing doubts something you are totally confused about in which case we will handle it right now or is everybody good we can wait till 2 o'clock is it all right yes, we waited to excuse me ma'am yeah tell me tejeshu ma'am can you explain once more that removal of summation you took so the removal of, of summation let me just share the screen again you're talking about it here right in this step yes ma'am ha u m n sorry That that step, ma'am. Summation of m u m n. Oh boy. Are you still connected? Oh, we've lost connection. I think we've lost connection. Oh no. again yeah so am i audible i think we will stop this class now we will meet at 2 o'clock and i will start with clearing your doubt okay tejeshree if you are around all right so we will meet at 2 i'll send you the meeting invitation right now okay everybody put in your attendance please so i will see you all at 2 Bye for now.